part of our engineering program, we're um, offering these mobility trips where students can travel overseas for up to two weeks into places like India. Um, and of course they can have this wonderful experience uh, where they're promoting humanitarian engineering. It's a type of experience that really changes their lives in, in so many ways. It makes them a better person, a better student, uh, and of course a better engineer. Um, and the, the most recent trip we had, uh, we, we had about 45 students from about nine different universities and I was lucky enough to go with them as an academic fellow. Um, and you know we saw so many amazing things on this trip um, and, and we saw the students being able to help these people while they are in India, uh, which of course is the ob objective of the trip, as well as you know helping themselves to learn new things. One of the one of the ma amazing parts of the trip for me was when we was was spending some time in the Adadali village in remote India, outside Pune, um, and we were there for about five days. and the, And the first couple of days, we really uh, spent some time walking around and, and meeting everybody in the village. Um, and it took some time to get to know um, everybody in the village and for them to adjust to uh, having us there. I think we were probably the, the largest European group that had ever gone through our, the, the village. Um, but we immediately struck a, a great chord with the, the, the children. The children could speak broken English um, and they could read our names off our water bottles and, and they were really excited to start communicating with us and playing cricket with the boys and the girls were all dancing and trying on saris and, and having a fantastic time. And we then were invited back to one of the houses to see how the people in India lived. And there was these two girls in particular that were very enthusiastic about um, showing us their house. They were so proud of their house. And uh, so yeah, we had a small group of, of us get together to, to go and have a look at the, the living conditions in this village. And when we stepped inside of their house, uh, it took a little while for our eyes to adjust because they were quite, it was quite a dark, uh, dark house. And then once our eyes adjust, we realised that they're actually living in the same area, in, in the same room with their livestock. Um, they had six or so cattle in, in this one room and, and the girls were sleeping just about a metre away from the cows. And that was an, a huge shock to us. We, we'd heard about it, but it's not until you actually see it right there in front of you that that it really takes your breath away. Um, and, but what surprised me the most about the inside of this house was how beautifully decorated it was and how clean it was and how so proud the people were of this wonderful house which was uh, constructed of, um, you know, the floors were, were polished with cow dung and the walls were polished with cow dung, but the place was very clean, very friendly, very warm and very open. Um, and then we realized that in another area of this house was, was the kitchen and we could see the, the lady um, of the family sitting on the floor preparing the meals. And so with the aid of our translators, we went into the kitchen to try and get a more of an understanding of, of what the lady of the house would do on a regular day. And she explained to us that while it was cool, she worked in the fields weeding and harvesting. And then during the heat of the day, she came back and would prepare the crop um, and prepare the meal. Uh, for the family. And while she's telling us this we noticed in the corner there was a gas cooktop and an open fireplace but the walls were very black and heavily laden with soot and the lady herself was, was coughing occasionally and you could see that she had been inhaling uh, quite a lot of soot um, working in this environment. And through our translators we asked her to explain how she prepares the meal and so she explained that they used dehydrated cow dung um, over the open fire to cook the meal. Um, and she did not mention the, the new modern, say, let's say Western style gas cooktop. And so we had to ask, you know, why, why aren't you using the gas cooktop that somebody else has provided for you? And she explained that she doesn't like cooking with it because she can't afford to, to use the gas and the food tastes so much better when it's cooked over the aromas of the dehydrated cow dung. And it was interesting that, that she would say that. And, and, and what we realised at that point was somebody else had tried to solve a problem. The problem being that there was too much soot inside and if they use a different cooking technique, that would go away. But that didn't work for them because it just created another problem that they couldn't afford to, to keep the gas going. Um, and so we turned to um, one of the gentlemen that we were staying with who was there with us 
who we knew was able to fabricate things out of steel and sheet metal and so on, and, and he can weld. And we asked him, and his name was Nana, and we asked Nana, you know, what could you do for the women of your village that want to continue cooking with these traditional techniques, but are obviously having some uh, respiratory issues as a result of that? And Nana scratched his head, and he waited for a while, and then he said to us, you know, I could probably build something out of steel that, ch that, that funnels the smoke outside. And so we straight away handed over, one of our students handed over their notebook to Nana, and we said to him, what does that look like? Show us how that would work. And then at that moment, he started to design a chimney for, for, this, for this building. And that was an incredible moment because we were able to provide him with a little bit of a guidance on, on how that chimney should be designed. But essentially, they came up with that themselves. We used the strengths and the skills that they had in their village to, to um, take them to the next level. And we've now found out that um, Nana has actually started manufacturing those chimneys and he's selling them to the village down the road. Uh, and that was a tremendous experience for us and a tremendous moment because that was when we realised we'd travelled nearly halfway around the world, jumped on various trains and buses to get into the middle of India and spent days, in fact uh, a good week or more, preparing to, to work with these people. But at that moment, our engineering students had actually made a difference to their lives and it was incredible and, and the people of the village uh, were very very receptive of, of our assistance in that regard to put together a chimney design for them. I've seen a step change in the students that attended the mobility visits. In fact uh, pretty much all of them have, have really changed in their mannerism, in their approach to their studies. They've become so much more professional and mature and confident and capable uh, and willing you know, they're, they're not holding back anymore. They, they know they can do things. They've been to India, they've, uh, they've learnt a new culture, and they know that they can actually make change in those situations. And so they're now eager to actually grasp opportunities and take forward everything that we throw at them. Um, and it's really, really rewarding to see how much um, these students change when they go on a mobility trip and how much of a difference it's making uh, to their studies and obviously to their uh, employability at the end of their program.